Okay. Um, hello. Uh, this is going to be the first of hopefully several uh, episodes that I do on philosophy and other sort of more academic uh, subjects, maybe. Um, and so one of the essays I picked out of mine um, that I thought would be a good introduction for this uh, playlist is uh, my essay on Plato's Republic and more specifically the myth of Ur at the end of Plato's Republic. So the essay I wrote is titled The Tale of a Warrior Bold. After one completes Plato's Republic, uh, they are left with an arduous and seemingly impossible task of solving the enigma, which is the myth of Ur. The reader is left with the question, why did Plato end the Republic with the myth of Ur? Myth and poetry have been just as crucial a theme in the Republic as the theme of justice and politics. One leading reference that Plato makes throughout the dialogue is that of Homer's Odyssey. But juxtaposed to his referrals to Homer and Hesiod, Plato also provides frequently hostile critiques of myths, poetry, and the popular culture of his generation. Plato argues for the censorship of myths and poetry in the just city, in order to have proper education of the populace. Also, and more importantly, just prior giving the myth of her, Plato argues that poetry is nothing more than an imitation of an imitation, far removed from truth. Plato's harshest attack on myths and poetry ironically prelude his own myth of Ur, the myth that Plato gives cultivates a conflict within the entire Republic, which this paper seeks to resolve. In this research paper, I will present 1. A thorough summary of the myth of Ur. In doing so, the myth will be broken apart into its fundamental constituents. 2. Provide interpretations from academic scholars who have written on this issue. These interpretations will contrast from one another in order to offer diverse perspectives to consider. Three, critical examinations of those interpretations will be proposed. Uh, this examination will offer possible defenses and critiques of the interpretations. Four, postulate a possible answer to why Plato ended the Republic with the myth of Ur. In other words, the goal of this research paper is to offer a new analysis of Plato's myth of Ur in the hopes of answering the question, why did Plato end the Republic with the myth of Ur? Uh, before summarizing the myth of Ur, it should be immediately stated why the myth appears to be ironic or a contradiction to what has been written so far in the Republic. There are two significant moments in the Republic where Plato presents critiques of myths, poetry, and Greek tragic comic plays. In other words, Plato is confronting the popular culture of his time. The first critique of the myth is put forth in Book 3 which pertains to the education and censorship in the just city. Education of the soul is done by music, art, and poetry. Poetry and music includes tales. There are true and false tales. Education makes use of both. We shouldn't use tales which go against what is beautiful or noble. Therefore, we must censor our stories so that their soul is shaped correctly. 376d through 377d, Plato. 
In this argument, Plato portrays poetry and myths as being a tool for education. Just like any other tool, it can be used correctly or incorrectly. Myths and popular culture, either implicitly or explicitly, gives the audience a notion of ethics and or metaphysics. Take, for example, Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound. In the play, the audience is told the story of Prometheus, the titan with forethought, who is chained to a mountain and tortured unjustly. As an audience member or reader, we are clearly shown the tragic hero suffering unjust consequences for doing a noble act. In Prometheus's case, that noble act was giving fire or wisdom to humans. The tragedy shows that in life it is possible for the hero to lose and the villain to win. And this sort of classic Greek tragedy is exactly what Plato wants to censor from the just city. Poets and writers of prose speak wrongly about men in matters of greatest moment, saying that there are many examples of men who, though unjust, are happy, and of just men who are wretched, and that there is profit in justice, in injustice if it be concealed, and that justice is the other man's good and your own loss. 392b Plato It shouldn't be allowed in the just city for poets and the like to perpetuate philosophy akin to Thrasymachus. To have the proper character and proper education, we need the proper myth. For those who live in a liberal democracy, they might abhor any censorship of any kind, but Plato's critique, while arguable, is nonetheless understandable. Since myths and popular culture impose on the populace ideas of metaphysics, ethics, politics, etc., then it is necessary for the just city to have only the proper myths and popular culture. In Plato's first critique, myths are presented as a tool which can be as harmful as it is useful. The second critique, unfortunately, undermines the first. It gives a more hostile argument, which presents poetry and myth as being not a useful tool, but something which ought to be thrown away. In Book 10, and just prior Plato's myth of Ur, he gives this argument. There are three objects. The one produced by God is one universal, unchanging, and true. The one made by the craftsman is many, finite, and particular. The one produced by the artist is an imitation of the particular. If the craftsman is imitating the form made by God, then the artist is imitating the craftsman creation, then the artist is imitating an imitation. The artist imitates the appearance rather than the reality of the object produced by the craftsman. Therefore, the mimetic art is far removed from truth. 597b through 598c, Plato. There are several problems with Plato's argument. In fact, the argument in Book 10 appears so weak that Plato could have made it erroneous purposely. What makes the second argument interesting is that it innately conflicts with the first. Instead of the poetic myth being a useful tool for education, here Plato argues that poetry and myth is more or less worthless. But if poetry and myth are so useless, why is it a recurring theme in the Republic? The reason why the poetic myth is such a major theme in the Republic is because for Plato there is an 
old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. 607b, Plato. Plato is combating conventional morality, which is imposed by popular culture, i.e. the Greek tragic comedy. Also, it must be considered that an imitator is trying to appear like they have real knowledge of the good and the just. Take, for example, the skilled rhetoricians who give grand speeches which imitate what appears to be justice, but is not, in fact, justice. This example is presented well in Plato's Gorgias, where Gorgias imitates one who has knowledge of justice, but doesn't actually have knowledge of justice. The problem with this claim is that Plato isn't explicitly attacking rhetoricians or sophists in this argument, but rather artists and poets. While this gives us an explanation to why Plato is attacking classic Greek myth and poetry with so much hostility, it doesn't justify the poor quality of the second argument. And this is why I will give a brief analysis of the Plato's second argument. Plato assumes that the artist is imitating the craftsman. But it could be just as likely that the poet or artist is imitating the form of beauty, or another form. Also, is there not a form for art in itself? While the watchmaker is looking towards the form of a watch, could not an artist be looking rather at the form of an art? It isn't necessary for art to imitate an imitation if it is reasonable for them to look at the form of art. In fact, in Aristotle's Poetics, Aristotle states that a good poet seeks to express the forms rather than the particulars. Poetry, therefore, is a more philosophical and a higher thing than history, for poetry tends to express the universal. History the particular. 1451b, Aristotle, Poetics. It isn't necessarily so that the poet is imitating the imitation. One could easily argue that the poet is thinking more abstractly. Almost immediately after giving this inimical argument against poetry and myth, Plato introduces the myth of Ur. This is the dissonance in Book 10, which baffles so many readers. Why, after telling us that myths and poetry are far removed from truth, does Plato turn around and give us a myth? The myth tells the tale of a warrior bold, Ur. 614b through c plato ur was slain in battle and after dying ur's soul escaped his body and journeyed to the realm beyond ur found himself in a limbo like place between heaven and hell it was described as being like a meadow the souls who returned from heaven and hell recollected what they had experienced to Ur, and they told their stories to one another, the one lamenting and wailing as they recalled how many and how dreadful things they had suffered and seen in their journey beneath the earth. It lasted a thousand years, which those from heaven related their delights and visions of a beauty beyond words. 615a Plato. Special attention on the notion of recollection should be made because it will emerge several times in the myth. Souls are punished or rewarded for a certain allotted time for their past actions in life, for all the wrongs they had ever done to anyone, and all whom they had severely wronged, they had paid the penalty, in turn, tenfold. 615a through b, 
Plato. If any had done deeds of kindness and been just and holy men, they might receive their due reward in the same measure. 615b through c, Plato. While there are some similarities with the Christian mythos in the myth of Ur, the souls are not trapped for eternity in heaven or hell. It is implicit in the text that a very small minority of souls that are extremely evil or good stay in their respective realms for eternity. After their allotted sentence, the souls are put into lots where they are given options to what life they wish to reincarnate into. The word of Lachias, the maiden daughter of necessity, spoke. Souls that live for a day now is the beginning of another cycle of mortal generation, where birth is the beacon of death. No divinity shall cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own deity. Let him to whom falls the first lot first select a life to which he shall cleave of necessity. But virtue has no master over her, and each shall have more or less of her as he honors her, or does her despite. The blame is his who chooses. God is blameless. 617d through 618a, Plato. There are two things which are peculiar in this quote. Previously, in the Republic, it appeared to be the case that an individual had no choice in their natural function. Justice was one nature and one work. If you were by nature a craftsman, then you must work as a craftsman. This falls for the other classes. However, in the myth of Ur, the soul is given the freedom to choose their destiny. The other thing which is peculiar in this is what the myth says about virtue. We are told virtue has no master, which sounds bleak for the eager philosopher seeking control of virtue. Like Icarus and the sun, virtue seems to be out of our grasp. Yet, earlier in the Republic, Plato leads the reader into thinking that with uh, phronesis, our or an ordered soul, we can seize virtue. It appears that luck plays a greater role with virtue than how it was presented initially in the Republic. The next passage continues the notion that choosing one's next life can lead to horrific tragedies. When the prophet had thus spoken, he said that the drawer of the first law at once sprang to seize the greatest tyranny, and that in his folly and greed he chose it without sufficient examination and failed to observe that it involved the fate of eating his own children and other whores. 619b through c, Plato. By far, this section of the myth is by its very nature a traditional Greek tragedy. It is reminiscent to the horrors depicted in Sophocles' three Theban plays and Euripides' Medea. It would be interesting to know if Plato was giving homage to Euripides. In Nietzsche's book, Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche argues that Socrates preferred the tragedies of Euripides over Aeschylus. It could be argued why this might be the case. Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound shows the just soul suffering unjustly, i.e. Prometheus being tortured. In Euripides' tragedies, the characters suffer because of their lack of knowledge. Because of their lack of knowledge, the characters make tragic mistakes which become their undoing. Whether Nietzsche was correct or not, what should be taken away from this section of the myth is that even the most virtuous souls can be corrupted and fall from grace. 
A good comparison would be Shakespeare's Macbeth, who willingly chose the life of a tyrant. However, Francisco Gonzalez compares this to the Christian myth of Lucifer, 267 Colbert. This comparison can be seen clearly when one reads John Milton's depiction of Lucifer and his epic Paradise Lost. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. 21 Milton. After we are told of the virtuous soul falling from grace, Plato writes about the classic Greek heroes, Orpheus, uh, Fame, Morris, Ajax, Agamemnon, and Thersites. Plato tells us that these souls choose the life of animals. Orpheus becomes a swan. Uh, Thamorus uh, became a nightingale. Ajax became a lion. Agamemnon became an eagle. And Thersites became an ape. This passage can be taken literal or figuratively, or both. If taken literally, we can interpret this passage as being homage to classic Greek comedy. There is a level of absurdity and silliness to it that makes it comical. It would be interesting to know if these Greek heroes chose the life of animals because animals lack logos or reason. Aristotle argues in the politics that the fundamental difference between humans and the other animals is that the other animals lack logos. 1253a line 5 through 10. Aristotle. A new uh, Aristotle reader. The passage could, however, be figurative. Ajax, being a courageous warrior in the Trojan War, chose the life of a lion. The lion is a symbol of courage, valor, and war. It could be that Ajax simply chose the life of a soldier, and we, the reader, are to infer that from the myth. This negates the comedic element of this passage, Therefore, it might be properly understood as being both partially literal and partially figurative. This allows the myth to stay true to the Greek tragicomic formula. For example, Orpheus, who wrote beautiful poetry, chose the life of a swan not because he simply wanted to live the life of an animal, but because the, swati, uh, the swan embodies beauty and elegance. That way, anyone who perchance saw Orpheus in the body of the swan would recognize him as being beautiful. To reiterate, the Greek heroes literally chose these animal lives for symbolic reasons. Eventually, however, Plato gets to the soul of Odysseus. Odysseus is one Greek hero which Socrates tries to embody or imitate throughout the entire dialogue. And it fell out that the soul of Odysseus drew the last lot of all and came to make its choice. And from memory of its former toils, having flung away ambition, went about for a long time in quest of the life of an ordinary citizen who minded his own business and with difficulty found it lying in some corner disregarded by the others and upon seeing it said that it would have done the same had it drawn the first lot and chose it gladly. 620 C through D. Plato. The reader is reintroduced to Odysseus, who has been a constant reference within the Republic. Odysseus, the man with godlike wisdom, becomes the symbol of phronesis for Plato. 
and symbolizing him as such, Odysseus explicitly chooses the life that Plato calls just, the life where one minds his or her own work or function. Odysseus is made into our hero in the Republic, and this is clearly stated in this passage of the myth of Ur. However, there are two very important subtleties in this passage. First, by using recollection, Odysseus remembers his former toils. Because of this, he stops himself from making the same mistakes that he made in his past life. Recollection, or a priori knowledge, seems to be a major component to Plato's philosophy. Second, it should be emphasized that Odysseus chose the life of an ordinary citizen, i.e. one who participates in a pub political community. Plato could have written ordinary man, but chose to write citizen. This could mean that Plato thinks that to fully realize a just life one must live in a society. In other words, one cannot live in complete isolation and act justly. But being a citizen doesn't necessitate Odysseus living a public life in politics and government rule. He chose, after all, the ordinary citizen life. More than likely, Odysseus chose to live a private life outside of the political sphere but still performs his function as a citizen within that political community. The souls, after choosing their life, go to the three sisters of fate. And the souls went first to Lachias, uh, past, who led them to Clotho, present. Clotho, under her hand, turning her spindle, ratified their destiny. From there, they went to the spinning of Atropos, future, who made the web of their destiny irreversible. Without a backward glance, the souls passed beneath the throne of necessity towards the plain of oblivion. There they camped by the river of forgetfulness and drank the water. Some drank the required or measured amount, others drank too much. The souls then shot down like falling stars to their new bodies. 620E through 621C, Plato. Ur himself, he said, was not allowed to drink of the water, yet how and in what way he returned to the body, he said, he did not know. But suddenly, recovering his sight, he saw himself at dawn, lying on the funeral pyre. 621b through c, Plato. This is the final passage of the myth of Ur. Like the previous passages, it contains subtleties to be examined. I would like to mention the parallel of the myth of Ur to Shakespeare's Macbeth. I hypothesize that Shakespeare had read Plato's Republic some time in his life. In Macbeth, there are three witches who speak to Macbeth about the past, present, and future. At the beginning of the play, Macbeth is a virtuous hero who slain uh, and chopped the head off the rebel McDowell Downwell, 858 Shakespeare. But when given the choice to usurp the throne and to live the life of a tyrant, Macbeth quickly fell from virtue. This is only my hypothesis, however. It could be possible that Shakespeare had never read Plato's Republic. In the last passage of the myth, there are two mentions of recollection. First, the river of forgetfulness preludes Plato's theory 
of recollection or a priori knowledge, which is given in the Mina. Thus, the soul, since it is immortal and has been born many times and has seen all things both here and in the other world, has learned everything that is. So we need not be surprised if it can recall the knowledge of virtue or anything else which, as we see, it once possessed. For seeking and learning are in fact nothing but recollection. 81c through e, Plato. The souls drink the water of forgetfulness, and once in their new bodies they must recollect what they already know. Plato in the myth is giving an epistemological theory for a priori knowledge, also known as rationalism. Rationalism is distinctly opposed to empiricism. Empiricism is the belief that we acquire knowledge a posteriori, or by experience. The problem for Plato is that it doesn't appear that knowledge of the forms can be acquired empirically. Therefore, he is left with the theory of recollection. The river of forgetfulness tells us not only why we must recollect, but why it is easier for others to recollect. Earlier, when souls were given the choice of their next life, they weren't given the choice of the character. Their character seems to be innate in their soul. For example, a man who chooses the life of an ordinary citizen could still lack phronesis in their soul. While the life of an ordinary citizen is ideal, it amounts to nothing if one lacks order in their soul. Phronesis is brought up again in reference to the river of forgetfulness. Those who have phronesis drank the measured amount of water. Souls who lacked phronesis or who direct their phronesis in the wrong direction, drank too much. Those who drank too much of the water of forgetfulness had a harder time recollecting their knowledge. In Plato's myth, we also get recollection from Ur. While Ur doesn't know how he returned to his body, Ur recollects his story in order to tell others what he saw beyond the land of oblivion. After the myth of Ur ends, Socrates concludes the Republic by saying, But if we are guided by me, we shall believe that the soul is immortal and capable of enduring all extremes of good and evil, and so we shall hold ever to the upward way. 621c, Plato. I will present three interpretations of the myth of Ur. Julia Annis's, Francisco Gonzalez's, and my interpretation. And Julia Ann interprets the myth as a consequentialist argument for why we ought to act justly. This is similar to how certain Christians will instill fear into their children. The children are made to believe that if they act sinful or unjustly, they will be banished to the fiery pits of hell. It could be that Plato is trying to be a fear monger uh, like some Christians, but unlikely. Annas argues quite the opposite, that the myth should not be taken literally. Annas believes that the myth is about the choice we make now and the consequences that befall us from the choices in the physical world. If we take the myth this way, then Plato is saying that we punish or reward ourselves now in choosing bad or good lives. Our choices can, to some extent, be explained by our past lives, which were not entirely under our control, and are limited by many factors. But in the end, the decision is ours, and we cannot blame anyone else, and we have to live with results. 352 Annis. Taken for example, the play Macbeth. Macbeth chose to murder Duncan, the king of Scotland, and live the life of a tyrant. The consequence of his unjust action wasn't a literal hell, 
but was his beheading by Macduff, 883 through 884 Shakespeare. Ironically, Macbeth was slain the same way as he had slain the rebel Macdownwold at the beginning of the play, beheading by sword. Annas does not believe in Plato's heaven or hell, or his theory of reincarnation. In other words, Annas gives the atheist version of the myth of Ur. Annas makes a fair interpretation of the myth of Ur. Um, however, if we are going to agree with Plato's a priori or prior critiques, of myths and poetry, then the myth of Ur is far removed from truth and shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, let me re say that. Um, I misspoke. Annas makes a fair interpretation of the myth of Ur. If we are to agree with Plato's prior critiques of myths, poetry, then the myth of Ur is far removed from truth and shouldn't be taken seriously. However, there are two problems with Annas's interpretation. First, Annas's interpretation demythifies Plato's myth. She neglects the possibility that Plato might believe in a literal afterlife and reincarnation. The theory of reincarnation couples nicely with this theory of recollection mentioned later in the Mino. Second, Annas's interpretation of one facing their consequences only affects those that are justly punished or justly rewarded. Take, for example, Prometheus and Socrates. They were both punished unjustly. Prometheus was chained to a mountain for giving wisdom to humans. Is this supposed to be a fair and just consequence for such an act? And then you have Socrates who was put to death for his love of wisdom, philosophy. This problem allows for the argument that there must be some final judge after death to right these wrongs so that those who are just are rewarded and those who are unjust are punished. Uh, Francisco Gonzalez's interpretation is completely juxtaposed to the one given by Annas. Gonzalez looks to explain the relationship between philosophical discourse, or more specifically Alenkis, and myths. In order to believe that we should practice justice with phronesis in every way possible, we must be persuaded not by the myth, but by Socrates. 275 Colbert. Gonzalez makes it clear that the myth has a strong conflict with the philosophy proposed so far in the Republic. Instead of emphasizing the virtue of justice and the just soul being able to endure any wrongs, the myth gives the contrary. The myth emphasizes the occurrence of souls exchanging the just life for the unjust life, and vice versa. The myth also stresses the importance of the water of oblivion, or forgetfulness. Gonzalez argues that Socrates doesn't define myths because he believes that they have no level of truth. On the contrary, this defiance is an acknowledgement of the myth's power and the power of what it describes. Faced with the tragic comic spe spectacle of the human condition as described by the myth, the philosopher can only exhort us to care for virtue and knowledge and pursue them to the utmost degree in every way possible. What the myth describes is rather what lies outside the boundary of philosophy, limiting its scope and continually threatening its project. 276 Culliver. The plane of oblivion is far removed in 
inaccessible to the philosophical discourse. Therefore, it requires the myth. The question I proposed at the beginning of this paper was, why did Plato end the Republic with the myth of Earth? This question I hope to answer with my interpretation, which is fivefold. First, the beginning of the Republic descends into the cave, or Hades. Katiban is the word Socrates used when he said, I went down yesterday, yesterday to the Piraeus. 327a Plato. Socrates, like the free prisoner of the cave, returns to tell the other prisoners that the justice they believe to be true is nothing but shadows on a wall. In other words, mere opinions. Similar to Socrates, Plato descended into the cave to reach us, the reader, in order to persuade us to turn around and ascend the cave. So we shall hold ever to the upward way. 621c, Plato. But do we murder Plato like the prisoner who returns to the cave to tell the other prisoners that we are looking at shadows dancing on the wall, that our conventional morality is wrong? Socrates descended into the cave to tell the Athenians, that their opinions of justice and virtue was false. Because of this, Socrates was executed. Second, uh, Cephalus and Socrates are not that different in the Republic when it comes to the Homeric myths. Cephalus grew up as a child on Homeric myths. Later on, he defied them, but once he got closer to death, Cephalus returned to the myths. At the beginning of the dialogue, Cephalus is presented as an old man who wants to give back to the gods. In other words, give ritual sacrifices. This is similar to Socrates. Socrates also grew up on Homeric myths. In the main body of the Republic, Socrates defied the myths. But by the end of the Republic, Socrates returned to the Homeric myth. Also, Socrates would sacrifice anything to get to the truth, even his own body. In many ways, Socrates is parallel to Christian martyrs. While it might appear that piety is left out of the Republic, the question of God and the afterlife are still present. If living a just and virtuous life pleases the gods, then piety is still implicitly within the Republic. A third, Alenkis is an essential method used by Plato. Alenkis puts to the test any philosophical theory through rigorous questions. Alenkis is used to negate or eliminate any false opinions about the forms. The goal is that in doing so, Alenkis will leave behind only true theory, like the siphoning through mud to find a piece of gold. Socrates also, in the dialogues, uses Olenkis to find guardians or philosophers fit to be kings or queens. The majority of Socrates' interlocutors give up after the use of Olenkis, but Glaucon and Andiamantus persist. They push forward like warriors bold. Glaucon and Andiamantus don't find Olenkis sufficient enough to answer what justice is, and so Plato must introduce a new method, and therefore Plato is left with the myth. The myth goes beyond what philosophy can't reach. The myth takes us to oblivion. Fourth, there is a personal dilemma within the Republic. Plato is just as much as a poet 
as he is a philosopher. And just like a poet, Plato rips his heart out and lays it out naked for all to see in the Republic. It is his magnum opus. Plato is trying to balance the complicated relationship which he has with poetry and philosophical discourse. Like the families that belong to Romeo and Juliet, myth and philosophy are at war with each other. As Plato had written earlier, there is an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. 607b, Plato. In trying to balance poetry and philosophy, Plato is left conflicted with himself. Fifth and finally, the myth turns us around toward the upward path. That way we can become philosophers and seek out the truth and wisdom. And just like the prisoners in the cave, we need our phronesis turned around. Therefore, Plato gives us the myth which turns our souls towards the upward path out of Hades. Plato, like any great poet, pulls on our heartstrings. He moves us to think about our presuppositions in a way no other does. While philosophers young and old might disagree with the ideas he posits, one cannot deny his poetic genius. Now, Plato has written a phenomenal Greek epic, which tells the tale of Socrates, the hero who died for Lady Philosophy. It is a tragedy old and pure, that it is better to die a noble death than to live as a tyrant. So let us die listening to the Orphic hymn. The work cited page of this essay includes Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, translated by um, Deborah H. Roberts, the hack, uh, Haddock uh, publication, uh, Julia Annas, an introduction to Plato's Republic, Aristotle, a new Aristotle's reader, Aristotle's Poetics and Rhetorics, um, Catherine Colbert, um, Plato and Myth Studies on the Use and Status of Platonic Myths, uh, Patricia Kurd, a pre-Socratics reader, Selected Fragments and Testimonia, Media Oh, Medea and Other Plays by Euripides, John Milton, Paradise Laws, uh, Frederick Nietzsche's uh, The Birth of Tragedy and Other Writings, Plato, The Collected Dialogues of Plato, including the Letters, um, William Shakespeare's uh, Complete Works, and Sophocles, The Three uh, Theban Plays. And now, before I... Uh, discuss hopefully briefly anything else on this paper um i just want to thank you all for um just listening um so far uh, i know uh, for a lot of you this might be a dry um tedious topic um and it ended, the video lasted much longer than I thought it would, but this is an experiment um, for uh, me as well as you, the viewers, I guess. Um, and it's good practice in a way, you know, uh, because of my autism, I do struggle to speak sometimes and uh, I need to get better at reading out loud um, and uh, I thank all of you for being able to listen through that um, 
Also, I apologize for any uh, mispronunciations of any of the Greek words or uh, slip-ups. Um, but yeah, so that was a paper I had written for a seminar class on Plato's Republic. Um, it was quite an enjoyable class. Um, and there's really nothing more to add to the paper, uh, uh comments wise. Um, now one of the interesting things that I really like about the myth of Ur is that there there does seem to be this strong parallel between the myth of Ur and Shakespeare's Macbeth. I have been for some time uh, planning on writing a separate essay uh, with my hypothesis on you know, the connection between Macbeth and the myth of Ur. Um, maybe it'll solely be an essay just on Macbeth with some mentions of the myth of Ur. Um, but yeah. Um, Odysseus is an interesting character as well in the Republic. Odysseus is a constant, constant figure within the Republic. He, uh, from the beginning of the dialogue, uh, there's this reference to the Odyssey. Um, Socrates, is, uh, to start out the dialogue, Socrates is going down to this uh, city, this town, uh, the Pyrea, I believe is what it's called. Um, and, you know, similar to how uh, Odysseus uh, steps down towards the underworld, towards Hades, and meets Achilles again, um, Socrates sort of does the same thing within the Republic. And it's really interesting to see these constant parallels between uh, Socrates and Odysseus uh, throughout the Republic. Uh, but what isn't mentioned within this essay is that uh, Plato tends to do this with almost every dialogue. So take for example um, uh, Plato's Apology uh, where Socrates is on trial, he's at court, and he's giving his defense speech. There's a strong parallel between um, Socrates and Achilles. Um, so uh, there seems to be a reoccurrence of Plato just making Socrates into another Greek hero. You have Achilles, Odysseus, you know, it, it just goes on, you know, Orpheus. Um, so in each dialogue, there seems to be some sort of connection between Socrates and some other ancient Greek hero. Um, and that seems to be a very clever tool that Plato has made almost into a motif of his. Um... Besides that comment, there really isn't much to say. And now, if you, the viewer, haven't read that much of The Republic, or haven't read it at all, this essay might seem a bit, um... You might be missing some things, obviously. You might hear me mention, I think, what was it Glaucon and Animantus and might be questioning who are those people what's their backstory or um, so forth um, or who's Thrasymachus um, 
And so this essay, unfortunately for some of you, maybe actually for possibly a lot of you, is going to leave a lot of things blank. You're going to have more questions than I think answers, which might be a good thing. I, I, I highly suggest that you pick up Plato's Republic if this essay you know, doesn't, uh, you know, give you the information you desire or you don't agree with what I'm saying, um, I highly suggest that you pick up Plato's Republic. It's a phenomenal book. It's by far, I think, my favorite dialogue of his. Um, and you can reread it, reread it, and reread it and find some new sort of information. Um, with a philosopher like Plato, I feel like you're constantly finding new and newer and newer information. Um, I, I don't believe really any uh, scholar or philosopher who says they can, you know, say definitely, I know everything there is to know about Plato. And I can, you know analyze them perfectly without a doubt. Uh, I think there's can be multiple uh, interpretations of Plato's work. Uh, I think because he was so poetic, so uh, such a literary genius, that his dialogues, they're almost less philosophy oriented as almost just fiction, uh, story oriented. And so, just like any other uh, great epic or story, they can be interpreted several, several different ways. And because of this, there seems to be a struggle, I think, with a lot of Plato scholars on which interpretation is the correct one. Um, but I don't think, uh, in this paper, I don't think I gave that... Um, I just gave my personal interpretation what I thought was really uh, great about uh, the myth of her and its dialogue. Um, and even in my interpretation, I, I, I would have liked to, I would like to think I kept it open enough that a, there's still room to have multiple interpretations. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's about it for everything that needs to be said about um, Plato's uh, myth of her, uh, at least for this video. It has <laughs> been uh, quite long enough as it were and um, I thank you all uh, for watching, taking the time to watch and listen. Um, and hopefully this will be the first of many, as I said, uh, philosophical oriented, more talk oriented um, videos. Some of them will be more uh, improvised and more impromptu while others might be more like this one where I reread a older essay that I'm currently no longer using for any academic reasons and I reread that uh, for you guys. Um, besides that, uh, yeah, great thanks. Uh, like this video if you did enjoy it. Um, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you don't want to see more videos like this, I do have uh, music videos as well as uh, video game uh, playthroughs. So don't be discouraged. There's, uh, there's plenty of stuff on my channel that I hope uh, you'll find some sort of enjoyment. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you.